I was um, buying heroin and um, we were going to shoot up heroin in an abandoned building. And uh, we walked into the abandoned building and um, there was a, another addict sitting on the ground and he was shooting up as well. And um, it, we watched him shoot up. We shot up at the same time and we watched him die. And um, we left him there. I remember afterwards, you never remember a kind of ODing. You knew that you'd done a really good shot and that you're probably going to nod for a while, but it isn't until you wake up and see that it's been like four and a half hours later. You know, I've overdosed and I've woken up in a hospital. I have responsibility for the medical examiner's office where we investigate deaths that occur suddenly and unexpectedly for any reason. We see a tip of the heroin problem in St. Louis and unfortunately we probably see the worst tip and that's the fatal incidents where people have died where heroin has played some sort of role in the death, either causative or contributory. Around 2007 or 8 we started to see those numbers going up of people that were calling us looking for assistance at the same time we were hearing in the media about overdose deaths and then in around 2010 it took a rather dramatic jump uh, and then it was unavoidable that something had changed. The heroin related deaths starting in 2009 was 63 and I think that's probably somewhere in the time frame where we, where we really started paying attention because it, had started, it was happening all the time. And then uh, 2010 went to 65 to 2011, 113. The change was twofold. One was a lot of younger people starting to use it, uh, and also the incidence of using synthetic opiates, uh, the prescription painkillers, as an entree to eventual use of heroin. You know, we're, we're seeing kids, young people, teenagers, people in their 20s, dying. Um, from heroin use, whereas we had rarely seen this before. I was um, in sixth grade going into seventh grade, and that's really about when it started, you know, just with smoking weed, drinking. By the time I was 15, I was shooting heroin. I was 16, I was with my cousin, and, um, you know, grew up smoking pot and drinking, but that felt better than any of that. But I was nervous, a little bit worried, but it was, I wasn't sticking a needle in my arm. And so far this year, we have 29 with one pending. And uh, that, that is just for the St. Louis city, which is, uh, you know, what, 15, 20 square miles total, 300,000 people. In the last three or four years, we've, we've had, you know, a doubling of the, of the deaths yeah, in the city. St. Louis County and the surrounding counties have had a, had a similar trend. Well, for 2010 in the region we had, and I'm including um, the whole region of the greater St. Louis area, we had about 200 deaths um, region-wide. In 2011, um, it's more like 300, so about a 50% increase. But why is heroin so dangerous? Why is it killing so many people? Why is this a drug you can never safely use? It's not like when you buy an aspirin, and I know that if I take a baby aspirin, I get 300 milligrams of aspirin in it. When you buy a bag of heroin, you have no idea what's in there, how much is in there, whether it's heroin or not, and what else may be in there with the heroin. Heroin is a semi-synthetic opiate. It's man-made from artificial and natural ingredients. Opiates are very powerful respiratory depressants, meaning they can stop or slow your breathing quickly with small amounts. As far as from the pure drug overdose standpoint, it's related, I, I think, into th three or four major groups. One is people get more than they bargained for. They thought they were getting you know, X number of milligrams, they may be getting two or three times that, so they take that drug. We do see some people who are fairly new users um, and just take too much. The other two major groups that we've seen are people who have not been on heroin for a while, often because they're incarcerated or they're in hospital or whatever, and they come out and they take the same dose that they had before, uh, handled fine, but they've lost their tolerance to it. And the other big problem we see is mixing it with other substances, and, and notably alcohol. People are out drinking a little bit, 
decided to try some heroin and the, the combination of heroin and alcohol is, is a horrible combination. It's a lot like morphine, a drug commonly administered for pain in hospitals. Heroin is twice as powerful as morphine, with a far more gripping physical addiction that comes with overuse. Another opioid, fentanyl, is 50 times more powerful than heroin, and between 2005 and 2007, it became very clear it was being used to cut street heroin with. If we want to understand just how powerful opioids are, we can ask someone who uses them every day. Well, today we're here demonstrating to you exactly how little drug it takes to stop one's respiration. Anesthesiologists, like Joe Ferrand, use synthetic opioids to safely regulate and put patients to sleep before surgeries. And this is a very potent opioid, which is what heroin is, but this is being used to cut street heroin. And this dose represents 500 doses of what we're going to give a patient today. And you, I'm pretty confident you will see that his respiratory rate slows down considerably with one five hundredth of that. Heroin found on the market today and used in the inner city and suburbs comes as high as 90% pure, 80% pure, 70% pure and lower. This is remarkably high and one of the reasons it's so dangerous. But even at 90%, it's still 10% unpure. 80% is 20% unpure. 70% is 30% unpure, and so on. We're, we're using a combination of sedatives and some painkillers because mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately surgery is going to inflict some pain on this patient. Um, the painkiller we're using has actually been used to cut street heroin and it is very potent. It's that 10%, the 20%, or the 30% that can mean all the difference. Law enforcement tells us that 10% can include talcum powder, vitamin B12, quinine, sugar, starch, powdered milk, or that 20% might be made up of strychnine, caffeine pills, diphenhedramine, methadone, or that 30% might be anthrax, scopolamine, fentanyl. Deadliest amongst those additives are high-potency synthetic opioids. And in my mind, it was just one step away from opium. And opium was really one step away from hash, one step away. It was very natural. It didn't seem, you know, the chemical element didn't enter to it at all. It was, it was like people have been doing opiates for thousands of years. We are meant to do opiates. You know, I'd have fantasies of Chinese opium dens. And, you know, I just seemed totally natural. No, the chemical element did not enter it at all as any sort of deterrent to make me stop doing it. And, and even if it did, you know, if, if we found out something was had a, a really heavy uh, fentanyl element or fentanyl ratio in the mix, as sad as it sounds, where do I get that? You know, if it's killing people, give me some of that because that's the good stuff, you know, and, and that sounds terrible now, but I mean, that's really how I thought, you know, if, if people are, are nodding out and going out on this stuff, then I need to know where that is. And usually the first question that you ask after you hear that a fellow drug addict died is like, well, what was he doing when he died? What was the name of the drug that he did when he died? Because you know that that particular drug, that particular bag is going to be higher quality than the, the other bags because he died of an overdose because he could not, he didn't know. And the sick thing is that you think you know better. This can enhance the effect, the pleasure for the user, and simultaneously raise the deadliness of the drug. For the heavy user, this is actually surprisingly a selling point. That day in surgery, the anesthesiologist could easily have administered another small dose, not unlike the quantities a heroin user might take in and reduce the patient's breathing to zero. We're down to 13, so one cc basically dropped our respiratory rate. A highly trained anesthesiologist can reduce a patient's breathing to zero with an accurate dose. They can keep the patient breathing for as long as needed. That's how potent opioids are. So Dr. Fran took us to a place that often overdoses its patients. The Howard and Joyce Wood Simulation Center at Washington University welcomed us to show us what an overdose looks like. Here they train doctors using two simulation rooms with electromechanical mannequins. They train anesthesia residents as well as residents and nurses. These robot patients display features of human-like blinking, breathing, heart sounds, breath sounds, pulses. For our needs, we just wanted to give it a little dose. The most memorable one, you know, the, the one that should have killed me, I think. And that was 
It was right around my birthday. My birthday's in August. It gets hot here in August. There was a couple times that I intentionally tried to kill myself, and I woke up seven hours later and couldn't do it. My whole thing was to get as high as possible where I was nodding out, but still somewhat conscious enough to know I was nodding out. And so to go a little bit further with your respiratory system doesn't seem like that much of a jump. And, you know. A low respiratory rate is the beginning of an overdose. After taking a dose of heroin with a fatal element or at high risk times, the user is helpless. Starting off with normal vital signs, normal blood pressure, normal heart rate. The oxygen saturation is a healthy 99% and the patient's now breathing at 19 times a minute. It was a time where I um, was drinking one night, I went over a friend's house, they had some good dope. I cooked up a very small amount for her, what I thought was a small amount compared to what I was doing, it was a very small amount. Cooked it up and we'd been drinking, um, which didn't really enter into the equation at the time. And now I know how deadly that is looking back on it, but it didn't register to me at the time that alcohol and heroin is incredibly deadly. Sometimes the shot that provides the overdose provides the most intense feelings of joy the user has experienced. I you know, and I hit and uh, I don't remember anything other than my face just getting more tingly than it ever has in my life and in, in my in my using career. Um, getting a bigger rush than I've ever felt. My whole just my my body just tingling. Stuck it in her arm and I pulled back on the syringe and she said as I'm pushing the plunger in, she said, I don't think I want to do this. And I said to her, I remember saying, I said, too late now. Especially my face and saying one thing, something along the lines of, I've never been, I can't, something along the lines of, like, I've never been this high before, probably not in those words. And, uh, you know, at the time, this was really good, like, pretty, pretty potent stuff. And, um, you know, I, I knew that I was only, like, this particular dope, I was only doing three to four pills at a time. And at this time, I was done with the tar. It was, you know, it was the white dope. And uh, I, I knew three to four pills, and I'm, I'm ripped. But I did five for some reason that day. As the drug hits the bloodstream, the addict can immediately pass out or not all. The respiratory rate will fall. It's already fallen from 15 to 12. The user becomes limp or unresponsive. It happened like that. I watched her eyes go really small. And then she looks at me, and she goes, now I know why you spend all your time doing this. And Boom, she falls out. I mean, and then like, I'm like, oh, she's just really high. And I look over like five seconds later and she's starting to turn blue. And I go, oh no, I snorted the dope. I didn't shoot up that night, I snorted the dope. And I was sitting there and suddenly I, I, um, I woke up in the shower. Next thing you know, I'm waking up and there's nurses and doctors and whatever hospital staff surrounding me while I'm in hospital bed. I don't know where I'm at. My back is like in rhythming pain and um, I've got blood all over my arm. Eventually, the patient will slow down their breathing to the point that they stop breathing altogether, and soon their oxygen levels will start to fall in their bloodstream. Eventually, the breathing stops and the body stops receiving oxygen. The skin might become pale. The fingertips might turn blue. Without assistance, the body becomes starved for oxygen. I woke up in the shower with people screaming at me. And um, they were very concerned and very scared. And they had weird looks on their faces and I'm looking up at them and um, they brought me out of the shower after I'd woken up and started walking me around. I drag her to the tub and put cold water on her. That doesn't seem to be bringing her out of it. You know, I'm smacking her around a little bit, you know, not like hard but enough to like, come on, come on, come on. And every time I'd smack her in the face, there would seem to be this kind of, like a very shallow breath would come out of her, but she's still like the color of her. I'll never, I'll never forget the color of someone who's ODing what that looks like. It's this purplish blue, it's so weird looking and it's like this gray. So. What I did is I, um, what I should have done is probably called the police in an ambulance, but I didn't want to get caught. I didn't want anybody finding, uh, finding that. So I took her in the room and I just put her on her stomach so that she, if she threw up, she wouldn't choke on it. And I just put my hands on her back where her lungs were and I would just push and I would just sit on top of her and I'd go, mm, and she'd go. <gasps> and I would have to, I'd breathe for her. I don't know how long I did that for, but it seemed like forever until finally she just woke up so high and she, and she said, 
she just she started to come out of it and she was still really groggy and, and really high but she looked at me and she said she said my back hurt um, but the only thing that was on my mind after I had just died was that I wanted more of that particular heroin I wanted more um, because it was it was awesome you know they told me you know they they, they blew a vein you know hit me with a Narcan so they had to hit me again with a Narcan that's why that explains the blood all over me and um, you know they, they looked shocked that I was alive and um, you know I, I like I said I don't remember anything other than right before I fell out and right after you know with all the confusion of like who are these faces you know I, I've heard I have a hard time with people who talk about they saw they saw an angel came down and touched them and this and that and the other. I didn't see any of that. You know, I just I was out and I wasn't sleeping. I didn't feel like sleep. You know, it was just um, it was just just done. That's all. And it, if there was a feeling at all, it was just like I'm done. And that was the in between. You know, just black. And when I woke up, I was you know I was pissed that I woke up. I don't know what happened, you know, like totally try to discount that anything had ever happened, that we just went through a total life and death situation right in front of me, and I tried to act like it never even happened, you know. Um, that's what we do. I don't want to kill anybody. Yeah, I was lucky to be alive. You know, my friends brought me in, threw me in a wheelchair, and wheeled me in, and, you know, another minute or two, and I would have been dead, you know, if we would have been further down the street, you know, or if we would have got stuck at a stoplight or whatever, you know, I would have been dead. So, don't know why I'm still alive. At this point, the patient has totally stopped breathing, has become apneic. The oxygen levels have fallen to a dangerous level of 70%, and the heart is showing signs of atypical rhythms. None of which, of course, can be stopped by the user. Most are unaware that they are dying while the overdose is occurring. Now that the heart has gone into ventricular fibrillation, unless the patient receives CPR and the heart is shocked, the patient will die. While editing this scene, I was notified that a friend who I'd grown apart from over the last year had died. Greg was a physician, charming, well-liked. A year ago, he called me from a vacation and told me he had begun using heroin. I'm still not certain how he died, whether it was overdose or suicide okay. by other means. But I know heroin contributed to his death. Hey, Sean, what's up? It's Greg. Um, been a long time. Uh, well, let's just say I need to try to get some help, and I'm hoping you can maybe be part of that, that for me. Greg had called after a long while away, and he was looking for help. The last I heard from him, he was about to check in to a rehab, and he was going to call me back. The next day, he died. Like a, um, there's a Dr. Seuss book called The Places That You Will Go, The Places You Will See or something. And um, it's supposed to be a positive story, but, but the things that you will see and experience, the things that you will do to get that drug will shock you and will keep you up nights for the rest of your life. I know it keeps me up. I just say that shit's gonna kill you, or what, land you in prison, one of the two. But I, I, I wouldn't believe that back then. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't think I was gonna catch a habit, you know. So, you think you're like smarter than that? Yeah, I thought I could have smarter. I thought, like I said, I could control it. You know, I could do it just every other day. Plenty of times where I would do it every other day, and then go drink on those days off, and then get enough booze in me, and I would. Like, well, fuck it, let's go, let's go cop. 
which turned it into every day. You will never, you might recover physically, you might even recover somewhat emotionally, but you'll never recover psychically because there are scars, you know, that will never heal because of what I've done to myself. Not, you are not smart enough either to beat it. You're just not. I thought I was. Everybody I know who gets high thinks they are. You're not smart enough either. Please don't.